uh, I'm gonna pose the question uh, it was discussed a couple of times it's not the one I posed in the beginning of this talk but um, um, the question to which um, some of your presentations uh, uh, referred a number of times and that's the question is this really is the is the hypothesis we're working with something you agree when it comes to a new state of war that we're experiencing now? Or is it something that you fundamentally disagree with? I remember uh, Lars mentioning his, in his talk there was not one 9-11. There were man, very many milestones in recent history that are of equal importance but probably not uh, discussed in the media um, to such an extent that it would create the impact we seem to assign to 9-11. The hypothesis we're working with is that the war as the way international law actually defines it as an armed conf conflict between nation states that's defined somewhere in space and time. Um, this kind of understanding of war has already uh, mutated uh, during Cold War which it was a kind of frenetic uh, pointing guns at each other in two sets of states. Um, in my understanding, never bursted out in open uh, armed conflict. It was not precisely defined in time, it was no longer precisely defined in space. And of course what we talk about in concerning war is very much uh, um, referring to uh, uh, um, a multitude a multitude book of 2004, War and Democracy in the Time of Empire, where um, um, Negri and Hart consider this to be almost a situation of forced world uh, war conflict, where no longer it's an armed conflict between uh, nation states, it's non-nation players, the war became private uh, initiative in this respect, and the most important feature of this fact is that um, there, uh, there, there's a play or yeah, play on absence of definition of who, when, how, where, and why. Now, many of the speakers and some of you as well refer to this as uh, not at all a new state in the world, not at all a new condition. Is is that? What do you believe or what's your stance towards that? Well, uh, I, th I think I'm on, on the side of, of Negri and Hart in this, that, and, and with you that yes, we are, we are talking about a new type of war or a new dynamics of war. Of course you can say there's, that there's some constants in warfare is still being fought by the underclass, for example. That's, that's one thing that I guess has never changed in history. But the fact that with 9-11 as example, that 9-11 took place uh, literally within the flows of, of, uh, of global capital using, uh, using the infrastructure of you know, airplanes, basically, to, to carry out this attack. Um, also, um, if you look at yeah, the, the whole issue of identifiability of war, uh, when Denmark went to war, Denmark is a war uh, present in Iraq, uh, and when uh, the Danish Prime Minister declared his support for uh, the promotion of democracy in Iraq, with uh, George Bush said, great, so how many troops are you contributing with? And uh, the Danish government responded by sending a submarine to the desert war. So, uh, on, on the face of it, they, they, they declared their uh, support for this, for this uh, democracy project, but actually, of course, they only wanted in on the contract of the reconstruction of Iraq. Um, so, what, what, what is a war? How, how is it represented? And also, um, yeah, I, th I think you, you mentioned uh, at some point, I'm not sure if I'm quoting you correctly, so correct me, uh, that uh, war is, is ever present at the moment, and and this uh, yes it is, but then then again it, it isn't because um, when typically when when we say war, then the image that resonates in our minds is a kind of World War Two scenario, 
uh, of, of troop movements, or it is, you know, uh, battles taking place in torrid countries, something far removed from us. And I think uh, Jean Baudrillard wrote a book, which I never read though, but the title was The, the, the Gulf War Never Took Place, as I remember. So that is also a big issue here. That's more something that is displaced through the apparatus of representation. And yeah, as, as we've also discussed, it has been ridiculed. I think that the, the main difference is like, uh, it's, I, I don't think that war changed uh, one bit. I think that the, the focus of the media on certain types of war uh, changed. So now we get to see more of these wars which are not official states fighting each other. We get more of that on television. You know? And these wars, I don't know, for 50 years at least, there's, they're all over the world, but they're not really official, so we never hear about them. You can dig up in the newspaper and find some little article about it. So now I think the big public awareness, because of the big media event of September 11, now the media found a, a new niche and it's televising all these uh, little conflicts. I mean, before that, you mainly heard about the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict. While it's just one in many ethnical uh, conflicts that there are. So I think that's the main change, is that the, the media stepped up a gear. But yeah. it, it's in the case also that, that the media was forced to step back again. I mean, this, uh, you could argue that, that yeah, like you say, the, the main effect of 9-11 was that, that media was taken back by the partisans, in a way. But since the Falkland War, the Falkland War was the first war that was so like draconically controlled, where journalists just did not have the freedom to move in, in the war zone. So war is, I, I wouldn't say that war is more on television. War, uh, television uh, cannot represent war anymore, in a way, uh, because War, war today, when we see war on TV today, is you know these yeah, flickering images of, of, of computerized missiles exploding on the screen. Yeah, but I, I think still the, the media now is very hand in hand with the administrations that conduct wars wherever they are. They've shaken hands really well since mm. since that because there was a lot of critique like oh we didn't have any journalists in uh, Falkland, so how can we get a real story? So now there is journalists, they're embedded or whatever, uh, to create, again, the, the, the media event of the war. And media events, they're not just for making entertainment, they're made for making public opinions. I mean... So, you wanted to yeah. say something? To me, uh, the notion that now we have new kinds of wars uh, is a major argument for justifying new means that have to be, uh, new steps that have to be taken. This is a completely new situation, terrorism is something new, this, we are faced with new challenges, so let's torture a little bit. Okay, we haven't done this, it's not good, but uh, it's, it's a new war, we have to do new things, so let's open up ourselves up for like uh, torture and other things. I think this is uh, part of uh, this new war, but uh, <laughs> new war of words, perhaps. That's kind of the new thing. But uh, Slavoj Žižek wrote somewhere, oh, he wished that uh, um, the United States would really be a global police, which is not the case, it's because w what the US administrations, administrations throughout the uh, last decades have been doing is like, just uh, uh, acting in, in the traditional nation, national state manner, uh, just uh, just keeping up with uh, own issues. Uh, there's no foreign policy in, in the United States. There's all, it's always internal policies. Uh, the last statement of Condoleezza Rice was just about you know these uh, uh, abductions of uh, Europeans. Uh, you, you know it. Uh, was just not a statement for for for, for European politician. It was a statement for for uh, American uh, internal politics. There's no foreign pol American foreign policy, in my sense. And this is new. Uh, things are always new when uh, one wants something. Uh, when one wants changes in a certain way, and. Uh, 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 there are always certain instances or certain powers that uh, power sounds terrible, 
certain uh, institutions or certain uh, lobbies that uh, like to have the authority to name things. A very good example is, uh, I'll uh, get back to my Balkan, if I apologize, uh, the idea of countries in transition, uh, which is a complete joke. There's no countries without transition. So, but who said this, countries in transition? People said, are yeah, you, okay, we are Western democracies, we have this kind of economical system, we are now at point B, B. You are still at point A, you have to come from A to B. This was the idea. So, uh, came up, beginning of the 90s, the word uh, countries in transition came up from social scientists, political scientists, and it's just become uh, just a normal word. No one thought about this. Uh, and no one thought about these maps who were just uh, common sense, you know, just... Uh, so I think there's uh, um, this battle over the authority of words that we have to be careful with, I, I believe. This is with my contribution to the idea of new. Now, yet I'm posing this question to artists, writers, philosophers, curators, intellectuals, not to politicians or... Uh, military analysts, and that brings me to the question that, that caused a uh, lot of opposition and I'm still very interested in posing that one. What is the role of artistic and, uh, and intellectual production vis-a-vis -vis this kind of uh, condition? Now, I would like to just to f bring a bit more of uh, a nuancing into the question. I would like to refer to uh, last session, actually where heavy industry, uh, the artist collective from Korea, stated that we far too easily assume that there is something as intellectual and artistic practice. They said the role of intellectual and artists are radically different vis-a-vis uh, -vis this kind of planetary condition. And I helped myself with uh, the notes from the talk. Well, they said, um, well, intellectuals have moral responsibility in the process of envisioning the change or alternatives. The task of artists, instead, is to appeal to emotions, not to intellect and reason. In other words, why, uh, while um, intellectuals are obliged to seek truth, the only strategy they thought uh, artists can employ is the strategy of being ironic about what's happening in the world. And of course that struck me quite seriously um, and the third part, so there would be like, what is it that we can do vis-à-vis -vis the situation? Is it true that we far too easily assume that there is something like artistic and intellectual practice? Or do we need to divide those two in artistic practice, employing completely different strategy, intellectual practices employing completely different strategy? And the third element to this question, which was also raised a couple of times during the undercurrents and also a number of times this afternoon, was the notion of we. I very easily say, what, what for God's sake are we going to do? Without actually trying to bring us into kind of, you know, a fighting in, uh, at the barricades. I really talk like staying in the field of our own practice, uh, what can we possibly do? The question I have, is there something like we, like this kind of collective subject that Lars referred, for example, today uh, to like we within Western democracy, what is it? Is it, are we actually authorized? Is it legitimate to talk about we? And if so, who, who is that we? So I'm actually posing three questions. I'm not really asking uh, to answer all of them, but maybe some of you would uh, feel like reacting like Benda now. Um, I think my first reaction would be, um, we of course is always a problematic. Um, but maybe Hart and Negri's um, idea of the multitudes could be useful in the sense that it does not suggest any, any kind of uniform or collective action even. It, it, it more tries to retain individual efforts. Um, nevertheless, those individual efforts can be harnessed to um, change the world. There's a belief, huh? there is a kind of creating common ground for those individual efforts, and you refer to it, quoting <coughs> Negri and Hart, talking about general belief in democracy. Is that something that creates a common ground? For, is that enough to create a subject of we? Maybe, maybe I would, I would um, instead of um, 
talking about um, a common desire to establish democracy because I don't necessarily think that everybody that is an activist, or everybody that is involved in kind of some kind of liberation struggles necessarily um, busy with trying to establish a global state of democracy. But what I do believe is everybody um, that is engaged in that kind of activities in, uh, greater, to a greater or less extent, trying to establish a bit more maneuvering space for him or herself. In other words, we are all caught in a kind of uh, web of power. Um, but we have more freedom than we think. In other words, if we use the, 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 the minimal um, resistance that we have at our disposal, we can actually create a little bit more maneuvering space than we think. And I think that is maybe the common ground, in, uh, which is maybe a very vague and a very broad definition, but maybe um, broad in, in the sense is good, because it allows for individual strategies. And maybe my reaction to heavy industries um, critique would be of whether or not we can talk about intellectual and artistic and whether or not we shouldn't divide the two is what struck me when I was listening to the other people's talks this today was that each one of these artists referred to philosophers. Um, so I don't know, there might be a different strategy involved. There might be even different objectives involved, and there's certainly a different means involved. But I don't know if it is interesting even to make that distinction, because to my mind, moral responsibility and the in, uh, uh, we, a heavy industry, uh, industry talked about intellectuals have a moral responsibility, whereas artists have to appeal to emotions. And I think what my paper tried to show was that moral responsibility is each and every person's responsibility, or at least an ethical responsibility. And I don't think when we talk about trying, uh, discovering the truth, that is necessarily the domain of philosophers only. I think each one of us have um, a right to safeguarding a kind of truth at a certain point in, in history for him or himself. And let me make this more complicated. Sorry, Sadi. The last speech uh, delivered by Harold Pinter, the awardee of a Nobel Prize, the British writer. Um, he begins um, he begins his speech with saying, as a writer and as an intellectual, I um, equally accept truth and lies because my position being a writer and intellectual is to see things in relations and allow a certain portion of relativism into my work. But as a private person, I insist that I seek truth. So he makes quite clear decision, division between him being an artist and intellectual and him being a private person and having different obligations in that respect. And that echoed Donald Chatz uh, saying when he was asked what did he think of uh, with Vietnam War, saying, as an artist, I don't care. As a person, I'm really pissed. And this is quite something that, are we actually on the right, right track when we talk about artistic and intellectual practices or artistic, comma, intellectual practices? Or is it just a matter of being a human person and are those two actually divide the ball? Uh, I, I think uh, a point here is that maybe in, in our societies, artists have a bit more freedom to pursue uh, truth. So um, they don't have so many uh, fears <laughs> attached. And in that sense, they can venture into territories that intellectuals can't. It's, or they define them as emotional territories or uh, uh, but it's a bit more broad what you can do in your search for truth and in that sense they can then inspire or work together with as often or quote uh, intellectuals. I mean I don't think there's such a big division or needs to be except in in the tools that you can uh, uh, apply, uh, apply in, in seeking it and of course uh, more responsibility it's uh, 
It's a personal thing. It has nothing to do with uh, your profession or what you do. Is somebody inspired? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, when you spoke now and you pointed out the fact that you said the three artists here all uh, mentioned philosophers. And I thought of Zoran, whose work I know very well, because we studied art together and I, I know his artistic output. But I also know him and uh, suggested for him to be here because I know of his expertise as a philosopher on the subject of war relating to art. So when you said, um, you reminded me that he's also an artist, so I just thought about his artistic output relating to his, uh, his intellectual output. It to me, regards very different things. For example, I, if I can describe some of his work, he would make, um, he would make uh, like a, an earbud, we call, uh, they call it um, the thing you clean your ear with, with the cotton wool on the end. And on the end of that, yeah, a Q-tip, let's say in America. On the end of that would be a very small, tiny picture of um, Sigourney Weaver or some sort, just anyone stuck on the end. And then he has like a picture of himself, a little passport photograph stuck in some hair gel in the middle of a bottle of very cheap 99 cent uh, lime green hair gel. Another piece he... he <laughs> it's a live exhibition just about word, doing words. <laughs> yeah. he, he imitated the, the, uh, a big movie credit sequence simply by passing sham cheap shampoo past the camera. So when you see the ingredients and the instructions, simply the pacing. There, are, what's my point here? Made you... <laughs> see, I don't know. <laughs> the, thing is, the thing is, his work is absurd. It's not, it's not a... It's not remotely... He, he did another one with that. <laughs> he did another one with that. Remember the record player he made? And it just had like, it just had like a little... No, even better was a... It was a VHS player with a... It was a, it was a VHS, a little mini TV with a VHS in it. And the, the VHS comes out, and while it plays an image, it, the VHS tape is just used as a mechanism to turn a little flower on a piece of wood. N anyway, none of these things, they're all absurd, they're not... You don't say, okay, this is war art, this is uh, someone with uh, Bosnian issues, because he does have these, but it comes out in the writing. But still he can deal with it in an intellectual sense, he's not an activist. And so, yeah, I ask... And then the question of a, a human being comes up, not an artist, not a philosopher, but suddenly I'm seeing here a human being. It has to be mentioned uh, only because, to add to the idea of the human being, the non-specialist, he also is a musician. So he's having a jazz, a jazz quartet in a high level. So suddenly you're looking at a man who does things. But for me, my question to him now is... To me. Yeah, because I see the show downstairs, and it's a show... I came to see a show about war art, and I saw that. It looked just like war. Everything has got the feeling of war. There were no hair gel, there was no funny flowers turning or anything. And But here is someone who conflates both things in one person, but very different outputs. So I'm interested... You, give, give me a question. That there, you know, you can finish it up. Your answer can be the finishing of the question. It, it simply it touches up upon like how uh, aesthetical uh, manifestations or evaluations relate to moral issues. Uh, so, th there have been different uh, answers to this question. Uh, one answer is that every moral, every ethics is based on, firstly, on, on aesthetical evaluation. Nietzsche, for instance, says this. Uh, the, first, the first thing that one thinks of is a certain aesthetical evaluation, and afterwards, uh, you know, the corruption, human corruption starts, and now you think about uh, Nietzsche, of course, always thought of uh, the, the Christian background, always this idea of the guilt that kind of accompanies every, every judgment. But to him, it, this was called aestheticism. Uh, uh, moral issues and aesthetics are, are, are not really separate, but the aesthetics is the, is the, uh, like the first instance. Kierkegaard says, oh, there are different concepts, they, diff they describe different attitudes towards your design of life, I I'd say. 
to me, I'd, to, in my case, if you ask me, not important. Uh, it's uh, you have you have uh, different spheres. To me, it's also like very different, and it's it's very uh, in my case, it, it's very random. It, if it touches upon a certain thing, and it doesn't touch upon in a repre representative mode, you don't have to show shootings. We, we were talking about this show downstairs. You could show something beautiful. Some it, it touches war, uh, upon war because war started with the notion of beauty. They were again my Balkan. They, they was, they, it's not. It didn't start with uh, hate. The claims of hate. Uh, we hate you. It started like oh, our uh, our um, Heimat, our homeland is so beautiful. They celebrated each other in the ni uh, 1990. This was this, this positive, uh, democratic patriotism. This is how war, war started actually with with beauty. This is how war started. Um, and then, you know, I don't have an answer, but I just uh, uh, observe that things are not uh, how, they, how they seem at first sight. There's moral issues and here. And, I mean, it's different in a certain way, but on another level, you, you discover more moral issues where you don't expect it. Like the beauty of your homeland. It's a I mean, political statement, it's, but it's only about beauty, very formalist and yeah, well, okay. Are there more people who want to ask a question in the audience? Uh, I would like to say something about uh, philosophers and artists. First of all, I didn't mention any philosophers. You can check the tape. Um, but I often find, as, as an artist, or what I uh, find more in or interesting in art is uh, that artists actually start off where philosophers they finish. Um, there's not so much point in regurgitating and repeating what philosophers already said that as participants in the modern society we know these, we read these books um, and then but what do we do with it? How do we um, how do we re-edit it? How do we play with it to uh, to use what we can to bring this truth, which is not only in words and in intellectual discourse. So I think that's that's the relation uh, between this philosophy and art. Um, well, well, to start with, to begin with the role of the curator, um, a, a prevalent definition of the role of the curator since the 90s is that Curating is a reactive profession. The curator is somebody who arrives on the scene when the artwork is finished, and then the curator operates. Um, the curator is a pedestrian bridge between artist and audience. It's like a, a common slogan. And, uh, and I think that whole notion of the curator as a reactive agent reduces the curator to being a merely professional agent, an agent within a professional sphere. Um, and um, and that I think that's that well that that is a risk to get today and because um, we um, we live with a lot of hybrid identities and of course curating is hybrid professional identity in as, in as much as it is it deals with content as much as management if you wish. Um, but we need to get it further than that. Um, and um, I would like to quote uh, the example of another American artist, uh, Ed Reinhardt, who died in yeah, the late 60s. Uh, and he said something similar to, uh, to Donald Judd, uh, namely that uh, the artist has responsibility to society as a human being. And it, it, it sounds like he's saying the same as Job, but, but he isn't in fact, because he, makes, he says that there is a difference, but that they're connected. Job makes a separation, a clean cut separation. And I think the interesting thing about Reinhardt's work is also that um, the way that he divided his own persona in different kinds of activity, because he, he was an artist, we know him as an artist, in the last 15 years of his life he only painted black monochromes. And so, on the face of it, he had this uh, like 
rigorously modernist position where uh, art was um, art was non-life, art was autonomy, uh, art was eternal, uh, art was idealist. Um, on the other hand, he also worked as um, as a labor organizer in the 30s, and he made he worked as a cartoonist as well. He made cartoons for uh, uh, communist magazines, and he, he was an essayist, a writer, a theorist, uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a satirical writer as well. So. Here you have a multiplicity um, uh, within uh, a, a persona, and, and they and, and those different um, um, uh, agencies they work in parallel. I would say in, in his in his case, and they also inform each other across from the differences that, that they have. So that, that that's that's a structural understanding of the artist or the human being uh, rather than a hybrid one. Just to finish that. Now, as a human being, perhaps we should rather say make a difference between citizen and author. That is also, I think, an, an important thing to, to bring up here, because what is citizenship is something we all, we all share. Authorship is, is something different and has and has different properties, and it's particularly relevant when we discuss uh, art activism, because I think a lot of that is predicated on on citizenship rather than authorship. It's interesting what you're saying, it reminds me, I mean, in the whole discussion, especially in the Netherlands, about autonomy of art versus engaged art production, etc. I was trying to figure out my way uh, in understanding what is it that we busy with also here at Buck. And what helped me a lot was kind of looking at the theories of a notion of public intellectual. I wish I would be able to make this, uh, uh, to use this adjective for this artist, but uh, probably agree public artist sounds uh, quite horrific. To the society, you connect your own interest, your own research to the society, to what's at stake uh, in society. And the third level, the most um, precious form of intellectual is, it's by invitation only by the way, um, is um, when um, um, appreciation of your opinions actually uh, make, uh, brings you to the position where you can speak about the issues of the society without connecting to your own um, vocation, actually. And this is kind of very simplistic kind of uh, positioning, but I think what we would be dealing with would be that level of being an artist um, who, who is producing work with intrinsic quality as an artwork, but capable of speaking um, to the world and about the world, about the issues that are at stake. I think that there's a lot of hidden intellectuals. We talk about a very small uh, section of intellectuals. What about all the people who sit in think tanks? We don't even know who they are, and their intellectual ideas are governing our life more than these respected professionals, I think. So, um, I'll look in the room. And I don't know what these people are qualified in or who invited <coughs> them. Uh, so I think most of the uh, influential intellectual work is being done by Behind secret scenes, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't think we live in a time where we have the Uh, the idealist quote of Edward Said pronounced in 86 talks about telling truth to those in power. So it's not guiding people, individuals who are capable of thinking, but those, as Godard says in the quote with which I open this talk, those who do things, 
but don't really have a clue about what is it that they are doing. But I think that's the same, that, that's the job of the artists as well. And I think they are, as Saji as said earlier, maybe in a more privileged position because they have less um, limits to contain with when they express themselves. Um, to show another truth or to highlight a so-called truth from a different angle. Um, and I think it's also a politics of truth. What counts, of tr uh, what counts as truth? Whose truth are you defending? I think, I think that is a very, very important role of, of artists and intellectuals, but I think, as I said, um, artistic strategies sometimes, because they have such a broad spectrum of strategies that they can employ, they can do it very effectively, catch you off guard. Now, unless there's somebody really inspired at this moment to so pose a question. There is, believe it or not. Uh, I have, I have a, a question, um, and it sort of needs a little bit of introduction. I want to uh, refer to something Lars von Lassen said about the fact that Today, capitalism, uh, or late capitalism, is very difficult to, to analyze today uh, because it has become irrational, you know, and I think what he meant is that it has become irrational because it's no longer about values or principles, but about, uh, I think he mentioned something like money, creating value, jobs, and stuff like that. So, what sort of communicates in that analysis is that today, with it, you know, late capitalism is a totally new phenomenon, it's a new thing. And uh, what struck me is then that when he turned from this analytical point to art, he saw an art in a sense the savior because he said something like art uh, is specialized in analyzing irris irrationalities or ambiguities. So what you have in this step from analysis to uh, art is something like uh, the idea that today, today's world, globalized world, whatever, everything has become so complex, everything has become so new, that we have to experiment, and that we have to, in a sense, also be pragmatic, because we can no longer rely on the old ideological models. And, uh, of course, then the ideals, uh, I mean, ex if, you, if you talk about being experimental, and about being pragmatic, and not letting yourself be guided by these ideological or theoretical uh, illusions, then you almost uh, have the two basic features of art, in a sense, you know, like art as the science of the new, as the art of experimenting, as the art of, you know, like basic investigations. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of wondering whether such a definition of art is then not, uh, in a sense itself, already the problem. Because, um, how should I put it? In a sense, I think what art should rather do is not just uh, come up with a solution to this new question, the new question being what can we do in these totally new situations, but question the question itself. You know, is it really true that we live in such a new situation, new complex situation, in which we can only uh, resort to pragmatics and e experiments to solve it? And I think. In this sense, you could say, is art and not very handicapped to deal with this uh, questioning of the question? Because it, uh, you know, it has this feature of being, exper of, of exper uh, being experimental and pragmatic in solving these things. And um, so let me just conclude to say that maybe today it's not so much trying to find an answer to the new, but rather to lay bare what is uh, old in the new. So I'm not trying to lay bare what is new, yeah, trying to lay bare what is new and, and uh, uh, old, what is old and new, sorry. And um, to, to just uh, finish up, I think in that video, uh, uh, Lars showed of, this, of Gilly Dolev, um, in a sense it's striking that the only real point, an analytical point, according to me, what I could see in the, in the movie is made, is in a sense a very classic Marxist point, you know, because they said, well, these Palestinians are used by the Israelis as proletarians in their economic system. So, 
in a sense, maybe that's also the reason why this video, the value of this video, that it doesn't just you know, to totally lose itself in this idea that everything is new and that we have to be pragmatic and experimental, but that it just reveals what is old in the new. And it questions, the, you know, the basic question that is today become dominant, like what should we do in the new conditions? So in a sense it's old-fashioned, but maybe art should then be old-fashioned and in that sense reject its maybe instinct to be new and to experiment with it. Do you feel it's a question, Lars? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, 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 well, yeah. Um, I can, I can pose this very shortly. Mm -hmm. is, is, the, is there not the problem with your definition of art, that art is, uh, uh, by its nature, equipped to experiment, to think anew, to all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Is the problem not in the definition itself mm -hmm. already? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to answer briefly because I, I know that everybody's tired. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't try to define art in, in my talk. I didn't, try, I didn't um, uh, offer a definition of art as such. Um, and um, I mean, I, I completely agree with you that we should not let ourselves become overawed with, with the complexity of the new situation because that could cut the hands of ourselves. Uh, However, the reason why I talked about rationality uh, was not to, to hype art to some avant-gardist position. Um, but my point is, is simply that you know, for 19th century thinking, uh, you had, and before that, you had a paradigm called nature versus culture. Today, that paradigm is gone, that opposition is gone. Uh, you rather have, if we want to put something instead, we could offer economy versus rationality. Because the way the world economy proceeds, uh, I know that this is probably uh, very, very, very simply put, but it proceeds, I would say it proceeds rationally, it proceeds without principle, it proceeds by, uh, uh, by taking apart institutions and reinventing them in whatever way that is, uh, that, that, that gives project. It gives profit. That that is irrationality to me. It's it's also pragmatism to me. That is the, the real pragmatism. Against that, we can try and encounter with different kinds of agencies and analysis. We we can we try and counter that with principles we may have. Uh, I'm I'm not talking in favor of being unprincipled. Um, uh, we we can try to counter it with a rational analysis. We can try to counter it with the means that we have. That, that artists have available uh, for for creating representations, um, we can this yeah we, we can we can assume a, many different strategies for for that. So last very brief, shortly formulated, simple English question to conclude. <laughs> There's not, I think it's time for food for everybody. We didn't eat the whole afternoon. I would like to thank everyone, especially our guests, all of you who bear with us either this afternoon or throughout the entire series. And one invitation though, uh, uh, for a talk with which we would like to uh, welcome the new year, as they say. On the 8th of uh, January, we have a talk uh, that's connected to the presentation of the book of the World Question Center Reloaded. It's the publication we decided to publish of the performance we did two years ago. The performance is so intensely resonating and inspiring until today. And there will be a talk uh, with Jens Hoffman, the director of ICA London, who curated that performance. Tino Segal, a performance artist uh, based in Berlin, and uh, Ulai, performance artist based in uh, Amsterdam, it's 8th of January. I'd be happy to welcome you all, and in the meantime, happy holidays, and thank you for coming. <laughs>